Good evening again, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome again to our course in educational neuroscience. We are transitioning to topics that have to do with actual teaching techniques, both this week as, in the, as it turns out also next week. The topic is more than we can cover in just one session. To start that consideration, we need to pick up where we left off last time in respect to the management of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. We need to make a couple of clarifying overall uh, comments first and then get into one of the major issues with respect to the treatment of ADHD, and that is its psychopharmacological treatment. Let's begin with the distinction between inattentive only and attention deficit hyperactivity that includes hyperactivity. In other words, we have two kinds of attention deficit disorder, one with hyperactivity, one but, w but without inattention. One with inattention and without hyperactivity, and one that might be said to be combined. And by hyperactivity, we now mean both hyperactivity and impulsivity. Now the educational significance of that distinction has turned out to be meaningful. The hyperactive impulsive only syndrome in our studies and in that, those of others, see some of your copies of papers that are starting to circulate with you this week. In our work, we cannot find any educational handicap or deficit that comes from the hyperactive impulsive side of the ADHD syndrome. That may be surprising in the sense that if children are wiggly and distracted, they shouldn't be expected to learn. But if all they are is wiggly and given to making random, unpredicted movements in space, that actually doesn't seem to hurt their educational achievement. So it's the inattentive aspect of ADHD that somewhat challenges and threatens and degrades their educational achievement. Now in that connection, it's also very interesting that while ADHD by itself, particularly in its hyperactive impulsive forms, doesn't seem to degrade reading or the learning of reading skills, it does have a substantial impact on the long haul of educational attainment. Let me put it this way, as you see in the Wood and Felton paper, um, that is circulated among you. The biggest reason for high school dropout and particularly for college dropout is ADHD. Now, dyslexia is also a huge reason for high school dropout, not so often for college dropout. Let's put it another way. ADHD is the major determiner of how many years of education a child will obtain. Dyslexia is the major determiner of how successful those years will be in terms of actual learning. With that aside, and as a matter for discussion when we have a time to discuss it, Let's go now to the issue of the educational management of psychopharmacy. I want to emphasize what I said last time, 
it is that the teacher in the classroom is often the only and usually the best observer other than the parent of the child's response to stimulant medication and we'll start with stimulants. The reason that's true has to do with both the time course and the dose response function in the treatment with stimulants. I need to emphasize then that you will be in a position routinely in the classroom to inform the educational management by psychopharmacy of your children or put less clumsily you contribute information that must be used by the physician in the dosing of stimulant medications and by the parents in actual use of it. And that, that um, contribution we'll look at in some detail momentarily. But let's begin with stimulants and let's begin there with Ritalin or methylphenidate and its more recent um, formulation which is excuse me Concerta. The only difference between Ritalin and Concerta has to do with the time course of the release of the drug into the bloodstream, a matter which we'll look at momentarily. Ritalin is gone from the body in four hours. If not from the body, at least from any behavioral effect. You can see some of it out to eight hours in the chemistry. You can know that it was there, that it was given in the morning, eight or ten hours later. But it has no behavioral effect after four hours. If there are exceptions to that rule, and I have seen maybe two or three in my lifetime, then they are extremely rare exceptions, not worth entertaining. The working rule is the pill they take at 8 o'clock is gone by noon. It has its greatest effect in the time between 1 and 3 hours after the dose. So within 20 minutes after taking the pill, although some parents can see an effect, we don't really expect a major effect. And at 3 hours and 40 minutes, we don't expect to see a major effect either. Think of this as aspirin. It's a short-acting, fast-clearing drug whose effect is temporary and begins to be noticeable in a half an hour and to reach its peak in two hours.